Welcome to carboxylic acids. So at this point, you probably know what carboxylic acids, the functional group, looks like. Let's just look at some carboxylic acids and give them some names. So you have your carbonyl and you have an OH. So this carbon is connected to two oxygens. Now if you have a hydrogen there on the other side, this is the smallest carboxylic acid you can have, and that's formic acid. And that is actually what stings when um, ants bite. If you have a carbon, this is acetic acid is the common name, and it's the active ingredient in vinegar, but it's also known as SN. Drop your E and add oic acid. So you can imagine, what would this be called? How many carbons? One, two, three, four. So butane, drop your E and add oic acid. Butane oic acid smells like rotten butter. Okay. Now, um, the butane oic acid, the carboxylic acid would always be the number one, so it's the highest priority. Now, um, we can have some aromatic acids, so this would be here, this is benzoic acid. That's probably an important one to know. The structure of the carboxylic acid group, so Let's look at butanoic acid. The oxygens have two lone pairs. What's the hybridization? This oxygen, sp2, the carbonyl, sp2. What about this oxygen? That's also sp2 because you can do resonance structures. So those lone pairs can participate in a resonance structure. And so that means it needs to have an unhybridized p orbital. So this would be a resin structure and so that means this group here is going to be planar. So it will be flat, it will be trigonal, planar. So boiling points, physical properties, boiling points are going to be very high for carboxylic acids, and that's because they can dimerize. So you can have your lone pair here, and it forms a hydrogen bond with another butanoic acid, such as there, and that's a hydrogen bond. You do them with the dash. And this dimer um, creates um, an intermolecular porous that you have to add more energy in order to break, in order to separate, which is what happens when you're um, boiling compounds. Solubility, the um, acid, they're very soluble in, F, in uh, alcohols, and as you increase the length of the carbons, then it will um, be less soluble in water. Now, carboxylic acids, they are the organic acids. So we've talked about the amines, and so amines are your organic bases, and now we're going to talk about carboxylic acids, which are your organic acids. So the pKa, that's how we figure out the ranking of acidic acids, this is your acidic proton, and this pKa is going to be anywhere from 3 to 5, generally. Okay, so formic acid um, is um, a hydrogen here. This pKa is 3.75. Acetic acid has a pKa of 4.74. So I just remember a range of 3 to 5. Now, you do have a table that's listed in your PowerPoints. It's table 20.3, which is slide number 16 out of 60. And you can refer to those for um, actual pKa's. Benzoic acid here. 
So this hydrogen pKa is 4.19. Now, what you're going to learn is that the effects of carboxylic acid. So um, I think this is um, okay. So let's work Pogel 22. So Pogel activity number 22 is called carboxylic acids. And so uh, model one is the acidity acidity of carboxylic acids. And model one looks like this. Sodium hydroxide. I'm not going to draw that arrow because that's not how I want you to do it. Okay, I want you to use equilibrium arrows. You also have the pKa value here of 5. I don't do pKa values for, um, for this because this would actually be, um, that's not right. So I will change this. So we'll make ours a little different. pKa is 15.7 and that's what the pKa is really referring to. Okay, and then you have this little thing here. It says review the effects that stabilize the conjugate base. And if you remember, we were talking about the ranking of acids, the size of the atom that the proton is attached to, the bigger the, so let's review that, the bigger the size, so if you increase the size, you increase your um, acidity, right? So HI is more acidic than HCl because I is bigger than chloride. Two, formal charge. So um, three is electronegativity. So oxygen is more electronegative than nitrogen, which is more electronegative than carbon. So your hydrogen connected to an oxygen is going to be more acidic. And then we had four residents. So if you increase the number of resonance structures, um, you increase your acidity. I think we said that was worth maybe 10,000. And then five is induction. And that's what we're going to talk about here, an induction effect. And that's through this sigma bond. So when we do electron donating groups or electron withdrawing groups through sigma bonds, that's induction. Let's um, answer question 1A. Consider the acid-base reaction shown in model 1. For the starting materials on the left, which compound acts as the acid? So this is your acid, carboxylic acid. Which compound acts as the base? This is your base. Um, label the starting materials above as acid and base. Using the pKa's, justify your choices. Okay. For the products on the right, so we're on the right here, the products. Label either as conjugate base or conjugate acid. So here's your conjugate base. This proton went here, so this is your conjugate acid. I'm going to go ahead and draw my electron flow arrows because that's what I expect you to be able to do. And then conjugate, we do conjugate acid. We assign that pK value. And on the acid, we assign a pK value. Um, and then we draw our equilibrium arrow towards the 16, which is your higher pK value compared to a 5. So that is about um, 9, 10, 11 zeros. Okay, because you do 16 minus 5. So that's how many times greater you would have it towards your product of the equilibrium. 
Compare the base and the conjugate base. Circle the base that is most stable. So you're comparing a base with your conjugate base, not that one, sorry. So you're comparing the base with your conjugate base. Which one's more stable? And hopefully you said your conjugate base, and the reason why is because you have residence structures. And resonance always makes things more stable. Sodium hydroxide, you just have the negative charge stabilized on the oxygen. Here, the negative charge is um, stabilized over both oxygen. And so you can show that, um, explain your effects. You would explain this with resonance structures. Okay, D. This reaction will proceed in the and hopefully you said forward direction towards your products. Let's go on to question two. Draw the conjugate base for each carboxylic acid below. Determine which conjugate base is more stable and justify using the relevant factors reviewed in model one. Circle the acid that would have the lowest pKa value. Okay, so here we have just acidic acid to draw in your lone pairs. You could just do any kind of base here showing the movement here and then you could draw your conjugate base which, and then you would want to draw resonance structures when you can. Okay, and then you have this one here. And you have the base. And that conjugate acid. Resonance structures. Now, which one, which conjugate base is more stable? And so it says circle the acid would have the lowest pKa value. This is going to be the lowest pKa value. Okay, and the reason why this one's going to have your lowest pKa value is because the chlorine, which is an electronegative group, will be pulling electrons towards itself. And so those electrons will pull through this inductive effect. And inductive effects work through about three covalent bonds. So you got one, two, three. After three covalent bonds, um, then it doesn't really have a big effect. So you can see that to stabilize those uh, electrons, because you've got extra electrons once the base takes the proton away, this um, electronegative chlorine can pull those electrons towards itself. And that's more stabilizing. Let's go on to question three. Rank the following acids from most acidic to least acidic. Explain the ranking using effects that lead to stabilization of the conjugate base. And you're going to have to do this on your exams and your assessments and your homework. Because just like you had to rank your bases and basicity, you've got to be able to rank your um, carboxylic acids. And you've got to explain these effects based on the principles of observed properties. So that's what we're doing here. So what you always want to do is you would want to uh, write your conjugate acid, draw that, and show your residence. And then you'd want to count how many resonance structures. So if one compound had more resonance structures, 
if the conjugate base had more resonance structures than the other one, then it would by far, probably about 10,000 times, be more acidic. But these all are going to have the same number of resonance structures, so you don't really have to do that. But what you might want to see is the fluorine is your most electronegative element. So it's going to pull electrons through here. So when this hydrogen um, is depronated, so I will draw that here, and you have a lone pair to stabilize, it can be stabilized more by this fluorine through an inductive effect. So this is going to be your most acidic. And I think if you look um, on your slides, so there's a table on slide number 21, the pKa is 0 0.23. So that pKa is lower than the 3 to 5. The chlorine is going to be your next, okay, so this will be second because you still have the inductive effect, so we're still comparing inductive effect, but chlorine is less electronegative than fluorine. We do have two of them, just like we have two here. This one's going to be pKa about a 1.26, so it's about 10 times more acidic than the, um, the fluorinated one. And then this one has electron donating groups. So the electrons are going here, and that ends up being about a 4.76 pKa. So that is about um, 1,000 to 10,000 times less acidic. So this is the least. And those are electron donating groups. So that's the difference. We're not going to do model two. So you don't have to worry about model two or the reactions. Um, I do want you to do model three. And model four, we can hold off on model four. And I'll do model four with chapter 23. Because really I want to do that on the last week. So I'm not going to do model four on this Pogel exercise. Um, and then for your additional problems, it says circle the most acidic compound in each. Um, you need to draw your conjugate bases. You need to draw resonance structures for every one of these in 14. And then you need to decide which one's uh, more acidic. You can check your answers by pKa values if you want, but I also want you to explain using one of the um, explanations of acidic acids. Um, if I look at 15, uh, you can omit uh, B and C. So just do 15A, and that's what we're going to do now. So 15A is model 3, and then 16 is um, definitely something you should be able to do as well. So do 15A and 16. Draw those reactions out. Draw the electron flow arrows. So let's do model 3. So model 3 is a reaction. So after you understand acidity and everything, um, model 3 is a Fischer esterification. And it is makes esters. I mean, so we're going to make esters from carboxylic acids. So you take a carboxylic acid, and you have an electrophile. It is your electrophile. You add an alcohol, which is your nucleophile. And you've done this before. And it's in equilibrium. So you got to add acid here, folks. Normally, that acid is sulfuric acid. And then you're going to make a tetrahedral intermediate. This is a tetrahedral intermediate. And then you make an ester. And this is going to get us into carboxylic acid derivatives, which is the next chapter. So number seven, for the Fischer esterification reaction shown in model three, which compound acts as the electrophile? So the electrophile is your carboxylic acid. 
this electrophile is strong or weak? It's a weak electrophile. Okay. Which compound acts as the nucleophile? The alcohol. Um, strong or weak? And it's also a weak. So you got two weak ones. What is the purpose of the acid catalyst? So usually that'd be sulfuric acid. And this is going to be to activate the electrophile. So we can do this here. So if this gets protonated, and remember an acid, the carbonyl gets protonated, right? And well, This gets protonated. I think it'll be simpler just to protonate the OH. That should be OH3 plus. And so if we protonate that. Then if you did a resonance structure here. Could that even do a resonance structure? That's not going to get a resonance structure. So you can't pronate that. You all see that, folks? Because if you pronate that, those actually, those electrons are not able. They're tied up. And so, okay, let me show you this. So these electrons really are in tied up. So I mean in resonance. Okay, so the only place that can get protonated here would be the lone pair on the carbonyl. So this would be here. And then you could draw resonance structures here. Okay, so that's the purpose of the acid. You're going to protonate the electrophile, and you're going to make the electrophile more electrophilic. Consider the action of a ketone and an alcohol under acidic conditions to form the acid tau. So let's look at that. So we have a ketone, which is an electrophile, and we know it's a weak electrophile. And you add the nucleophile, and this is a weak nucleophile, and you add acid. And it shows you that you get your acid tau. So the alcohol acts as a nucleophile. This nucleophile is weak because it doesn't have any negative charge. Draw the first step of the reaction mechanism when the ketone reacts with the acid. So the first thing that happens is you get protonation of the oxygen lone pair. And this activates your electrophile because now if you draw your resonance structures, you would see you have a full positive charge on your carbon. Draw the first step of this reaction mechanism with the ketone when it reacts with the acid. What is the purpose of the acid catalyst? To activate your electrophile. Does your answer to 8C agree with 7B? What's similar about the reaction of the acid with the ketone compared to the reaction with the carboxylic acid? Both of these um, pro are there to protonate the carbonyl oxygen to make it more electrophilic. 
9A, draw the product obtained after the first step of the reaction of the carboxylic acid with the acid. So we did this here. Okay, so you can copy that there. It should be similar to the reaction of the ketone. Draw all possible resonance forms for this compound. So we did that too. Okay, so 9B. The protonated carboxylic acid from 9A would be more or less reactive as electrophile. So it would be more as electrophile than a neutral carboxylic acid. Once protonated, the carboxylic acid can react with the neutral alcohol to form the tetrahedral intermediate. Draw this process using curved arrows to show the electron movement. Okay, so let's do that. So we have our carboxylic acid that's protonated. And now we have our alcohol, which is the ROH. And it'll come here, and those electrons go up. And you form your tetrahedral intermediate. And then this is going to get deprotonated because we really want our tetrahedral intermediate not to have that positive charge. So your acid will deprotonate to regenerate the acid catalyst and then you get your hydrated hemiacetal tetrahedral intermediate and then the question is why is the intermediate called a tetrahedral intermediate and that's because this carbon has gone from an sp2 trigonal planar hybridization to an sp3 and that's a tetrahedral so this is now a tetrahedral carbon sp3 hybridization let's answer 10 consider the second step of the Fischer sterification shown in model 3 what molecule is removed from the tetrahedral intermediate to form the ester so we're going to remove water so we still have our acid catalyst, and now we got to make water a good leaving group, and so we need to protonate it. And then we reform our carbonyl, and this leaves, so water leaves. Excuse me. And then we have something that looks like this. And then water would once again deprotonate that to make a catalyst, acid catalyst, and you would get your ester. Um, propose a mechanism for this step using curved arrows to show the electron movement. The Fischer esterification is an equilibrium process. So we have to force it to form esters. So the Chantelier's principle, because each one of these are equilibrium, you remove water. So one of the ways to do this is to do a Dean Stark trap. You can look that up. And you can pull off the water in the reaction, pulling that water off, um, because when this generates water as the leaving group here you can pull that off and when you pull that off then you actually um, drive the reaction forward so that's the Fischer esterification now once you have a Fischer esterification um, there's also so we're talking about the ester you can get trans esterification and you can get saponification so let's just go ahead and look at the ester. Ester is a derivative of the acid. So once you have an ester, so let's just look at this. This is called methyl, and there's two carbons there. So this would be methyl ethanoic acid, and that's how you name 
um, esters. So you look at this, whatever is connected to the oxygen, you name that first, methyl, and then you count your carbons. And there's two here. You drop your E, ethanoic acid. Now, if you put this reaction in, um, let's say, ethanol. So if you put this with ethanol and you add a little bit of acid, then you'll get a thing called transesterification. And what happens is you would get CH2, CH3, and this would be um, ethyl ethanoic acid. And so how does that work? Well, you could protonate your oxygen here, just like we did in the Fischer esterification. And this makes it more electrophilic. And then your weak nucleophile is your ethanol. And you have more of it. So when you have more of it, then it's going to attack. And this will be an equilibrium process. You form your tetrahedral intermediate. And I'm just going to go ahead and have that as a deprotonation step. So there's your tetrahedral intermediate. And then you still have acid. So now the, um, and it's a productive reaction. So do you protonate the OH or the um, OCH3? In this case, it's the OCH3 that's going to lead to the, what we call a productive reaction the one you want. So you go ahead and protonate that to make it a good leaving group. And here you have just more of the ethanol. And then what happens here is you reform the carbonyl. This leaves. And you form your carbonyl here. And you have now the ethyl um, and then you regenerate your acid catalyst by deprotonating that, and that is how you do transesterification, and that makes ethyl ethanoic acid. Now, saponification is what um, got gave soap its name. So, soap is a um, carboxylic acid derivative, and it's generated by carboxylic by saponification reaction. So if you take something like this methyl ethanoate and you react it with like sodium hydroxide in water, then this is a strong nucleophile. And so this OH minus doesn't need to activate this um, acid and you get a tetrahedral intermediate once again. This time the OH has added here. And now you can reform your carbonyl, and this ends up being your leaving group. A lot of times you have to do heat and drive these to completion, but this is a way to, um, so this one you add water and you can drive it to the carboxylic acid. If you remove water, so then you take the carboxylic acid with the alcohol, so in this case, the CH3OH, So, and you add acid and you remove the water, this is called Fischer esterification. So what's the opposite of day? Night. What's the opposite of dark? Light. What's the opposite of Fischer esterification, where you have carboxylic acid? acid and alcohol to make an ester, saponification, where you take your ester, you add sodium hydroxide and water, and, and, you, have, and you heat it, and then you make your carboxylic acid. That pretty much wraps up carboxylic acids, um, and then the next section will be carboxylic acid derivatives. One more thing I want to add is um, just a few reactions 
in order to synthesize carboxylic acids before we go on to the review of reactions and derivatives of carboxylic acids. So um, you can do oxidation of primary alcohols and aldehydes. And you can do this with chromic acid. So H2Cr um, 207 or Cr207 sodium in sulfuric acid. This is the Jones reagent. And that will take a primary alcohol or an aldehyde all the way to carboxylic acid. You can also cleave an alkene um, with hot concentrated potassium permanganate. So if you have an alkene, this would make two molecules of, um, well here, let's make this a CH3 here. This is CH3. That would make two molecules of um, ethanoic acid. And so that would have to have a hydrogen present. And then you could also do ozonolysis. So remember one, two, DMS of an alkyne. So here we have an alkyne. And that would give you two molecules of ethanoic acid. That's ozonolysis. And then um, the one that is probably new to you is um, alkyl benzenes or oxidized um, alkyl um, aromatic. So benzene, uh, yeah, alkyl benzene. So this is what they're calling an alkyl benzene. So you can also oxidize this with hot concentrated potassium permanganate. And because this is a benzylic um, carbon, sp3 carbon, this will oxidize to the carboxylic acid. And so those are side chains, alkyl benzenes. You can also use um, chromic acid, so Na2Cr2O7 and sulfuric acid and heat, and that will do benzylic oxidation. Another way to make Grignards is, or not to make Grignards, but carboxylic acids, is to take a Grignard, so if you make a Grignard reagent, an ether, and you react it with carbon dioxide. Does anybody know where you could find carbon dioxide? It's dry ice. So if you take this dry ice, then you can, and then, so you do that, and then you treat it with a little bit of acid. You actually, one, two, three, get a carboxylic acid and you've added this carbon here. So this is this carbon. If you've made a new carbon-carbon bond and you and this reaction is kind of cool because you create your Grignard and then you actually just open it up and throw in some carbon dioxide which is a chunk of dry ice. So that's one way to make carboxylic acids. Um, it's a, also called, this is called CO2 insertion. But you're increasing the number of carbons by one. Let's look at hydrolysis of nitriles. That's another way. So if you do a, a nitrile reaction, which we talked about this in... Um, the amines chapter, making amines. So if you take this here, you got one, two, three carbons. Now you got a new carbon here. So one, two, three carbon, and then you have this. This is your SN2 reaction. Um, we've talked about how you could take lithium aluminum hydride 
and then treat that with acid and you get CH2, NH2 and this one is there and you increase your um, carbon chain by another carbon we call that a homologue so you have added a CH2 but people if you treat this with either um, acid and water and this is harsh you gotta heat it or you can do sodium hydroxide in water with heat then you can hydrolyze that to the carboxylic acid and so your carbon of the carboxylic acid is the blue here and then the red is that carbon you are once again an extra molecule of carbon just like you did with the Grignard. So those are one, two, three, four, five, six ways to make carboxylic acids. And um, now we'll talk about carboxylic acid derivatives where we um, can go to acid chlorides, esters, amides,